Hi there, this is Mr Evans. This video looks at answering the multiple choice questions that you're going to face in paper one. Just to remind you that you can be assessed on any one of the topics that's listed in the specification across all of the A-level papers, but they do like to test a wide range of knowledge in these multiple choice questions, including the AS knowledge, including the stuff in the six units that you probably would have studied in year 12. So it's really vital to know all of the content in the specification. So uh, paper one starts off with 15 multiple choice questions. What do I recommend? Well, I recommend very much starting with the multiple choice questions. There's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that you can um, use them as a, a warm up. They, they, you know, get you thinking in a business studies type way. The second is that they do cover a breadth of the course and subconsciously it might remind you of a little theory or something that you'll be able to use later on in the exam in a longer question, maybe one of the 25 mark essays at the end or a um, longer analyzed question. You know, it might just get you thinking of, of something that you may not otherwise have thought that will enhance the quality of an answer later on. Finally, they, there will be some in here that you will be you know, reasonably confident that you have got right. So it can help boost your confidence going into the rest of the exam if you have started with the multiple choice questions and you can be pretty sure that you've got a few right. That's going to help get you settled, calm you down and you can crack on with the rest of the exam. So in terms of strategies for answering the multiple choice questions, well first of all I would recommend not just um, putting the correct answer but if you need to just annotating the question, putting down any notes or chains of argument that you've got going on in your mind. Writing down any formulas if it's a calculation question, that's really important, making sure you've got the formula the right way around rather than just trying to do it in your head. Maybe just get it down on paper so it's really clear and um, then you can do the uh, calculations uh, that you need to. So I would very much recommend annotating the question. I would think about the correct response before reading the actual option. So read the question and then you know, maybe cover the answers or not, not quite read the answers and just think through, right, what, what are the options going to be? What, what sort of thing am I going to look for uh, when I'm reading these options? And then I can eliminate, um, and, and then I've, I've at least thought through the question before I've even looked at what options they've given me. Now that might make the obvious answer very, very clear as soon as I look at the options, or it can help me eliminate um, some of the obviously incorrect answers. All right, often there will be, you know, two answers that are clearly wrong and then maybe two that you're stuck on. If you can eliminate the incorrect answers, it gives you a better chance of working out the correct answer. And if you're really stuck and you can't eliminate anything, or even if you can eliminate two, then just guess and move on. Um, I've come across several students this year who, in my classes, who have fail to answer a multiple choice question and when I ask them about it you know they'll say something along the lines of well I wasn't sure of the answer so I wanted to move on and I, I forgot to come back to the question at the end and that's understandable isn't it I mean you, we, you look at a multiple choice question you think right I'll come back to that at the end and in fact then you get absorbed in an essay and you totally forgot that you've left a multiple choice question now if you are if you are unsure and you think you want to come back to a question, just put an answer and then just maybe star the question and if you remember at the end, come back to it. But definitely make sure before you move on you've got an answer for all 15 multiple choice questions and then if you need to, you can come back and double check them at the end if you've, if you've uh, managed your time well in the exam. So... <clears throat> Here's uh, an example, There's, I'll go for a couple of examples of questions. So first of all, it's just worth noting that this is a price elasticity of demand question. It, um, it comes from an A-level paper. Now this is something that was covered in unit three, um, which is in one of the AS units, but it's a synoptic paper. It tests everything that could have come up. So it is important to know everything from the whole specification. So that's the first thing to note. So 
The second thing is it's about price elasticity of demand. So I, I noticed that minus 0 0.6, I'm already thinking that this product is uh, has price inelastic demand. That means consumers aren't very responsive. So what happens if the price decreases by 3%? Well, I can think straight away. Well, consumers aren't very responsive to that. So demand will go up, but not by much. All right, so demand's going to go up, um, but not by much. And in fact, actually, we know that if you want to increase revenue of the revenue earned from a price inelastic product, you need to increase the price. So potentially there's going to be a fall in revenue. Now, if I have a quick look at the options like that, I can see that there's no calculation required. So I won't bother working out. I could, if I needed to, work out exactly what would happen to um, demand, but I don't need to. Um, all I know is that the quantity demanded as a price decrease, the quantity demanded is going to rise. So I can eliminate these two that say the quantity demand will fall. And sales revenue is going to fall as well. So I'm left with option A. So um, I've been able to use a couple of methods there. Uh, just thinking about the uh, thinking about the answers before I've looked at the options. Um, I've eliminated a couple and that's left me with two. And if I wasn't sure of the right answer, I could have just um, marked one of those two and I'd have had a 50% chance of being right. Okay, so interest rates came up in unit one, but gearing came up in uh, unit seven. So this is taking an AS concept and applying some A-level knowledge to it as well. So an increase in interest rate. Now, if this came up, I'd be tempted to get my pen up and I would just write some little notes. So interest rates affect the cost of borrowing and they also um, affect the reward for saving. OK, so if interest rates go up, the cost of borrowing goes up and the reward for saving goes up. Now, let's apply this to the case study highly geared so this is a company that's borrowed a lot of money and rising interest rates is going to increase their cost of borrowing okay so that's not good and a house builder well I know that um, house builders you know they sell expensive products people have to borrow money to buy uh, to buy houses and if the cost of borrowing is going up that's not going to be good news. So let's have a quick look at the options. Um, so what's going to happen if there's an increase in interest rates? Well, a highly geared, we've said that it's not going to be good news because I've borrowed lots of money. So it's going to increase my costs. So therefore I can eliminate A, I can eliminate B. Um, and I think it's going to decrease demand too. So I'm left with C it's going to increase costs and decrease demand. So in this case, I've just scribbled some notes there just to remind me what interest rates are. And then um, I've managed to eliminate a couple of options and select the right option, hopefully, as a result of my uh, annotations and elimination. OK, so uh, this question a new software application costs five million and has an expected lifetime of five years it's expected to provide a net return of 1.5 million a year so key thing i need to calculate the payback period all right so it's very important for me at least you might be really good at maths and be able to work it out straight away i certainly am not and i need to have a system to use for these investment appraisal type questions. So I'm going to get my pen out and I'm going to do the following. Um, I'm going to have it a year and I'm going to have a um, sorry, total return. All right. All right, I'll obviously write a bit quicker in the exam. Uh, but uh, in year zero, the total return on the project is minus five it cost me five million but it earned 1.5 million a year so by the end of year one I've got back 
1.5 million. So 5 plus 1.5 is 3.5. And by the way, even though that's a relatively simple calculation, I would be using a calculator just to double check. Don't be a hero in the exam, especially if you're not confident with numbers. All right. Um, use the calculator because you're allowed to. That's supposed to be a 2. Okay. So uh, minus 2. So minus 2 uh, plus 1.5. It's returning 1.5 million a year. Remember, that's what I'm doing here. I'm adding up these 1.5 million. That leaves me with 0.5 million. And I can see straight away that the investment is going to be paid back sometime in year three. All right, now there's only one option for year three, which is option C. So I can be relatively confident that that's the case. If I needed to check that further, all right, I would remember how to calculate payback, um, in which case uh, I've got 0 0.5 million left to pay off at the end of year three. So I've, I just wanted to check, I could do 1.5 divided by 12. The project returns 1.5 uh, million a year. There are 12 months in a year, so 1.5 divided by 12. I'm just putting it into a calculator. That equals 0 0.125. Okay, and um, I've got 0 0.5 million to pay off. So I put take 0 0.5 million, I divide that by 0 0.125. Okay, this is my formula for how to pay, calculate payback. And that does give me four equals four, which confirms that it is four months that uh, it's gonna be. So I've got the correct answer. To be honest though, because there was, it's obvious that it gets paid back after three years once I've done this. I shouldn't need to do that final bit. Okay, there's the payback there. All right, final question. This is to reinforce that you need to know all of those business theories, uh, models that you've been looking at over the last few years, the last couple of years, um, to get the answers to a lot of these multiple choice questions. They like to test your knowledge of the model, Griner's theory of growth, etc. in these multiple choice questions. This one's about Bow Bowman's strategy clock. If I know Bowman's strategy clock, I can picture that focus differentiation um, means it, that it's high price and high added value. And I just even know that or I don't. I mean, maybe I'd be able to guess, but it's really important to just know all those models so you can be 100% confident when you're putting down your answer.